I grew up in the Snoqualmie Valley. Like a lot of people uh, my generation, one of the first jobs I took was at Carnation Farm. Uh, a lot of people would get a job in the early days. They would come to the farm, they'd work a little while, find something they liked to do better, and they would leave. And then there was people like our new uh, state treasurer, Dwayne Davidson. He worked here in the 1980s, worked his way through college, and uh, went all the way to the top. And then there's guys like me that just never found anything they liked to do better, uh, either lazy or just content, because this is the home of contented cows. And uh, so I just stayed. Uh, to give you an idea of the history of Carnation Farm, and we're going to go through about 100 years of history. Uh, unfortunately, it takes me almost that long to tell it, so I hope you'll have patience with me. Uh, <laughs> But we're going to do a very brief history of E.A. Stewart, who was the founder of the company. Uh, he was a pretty remarkable man. He was born in 1856 in Guilford County, North Carolina. He was the 12th of 13 children. And the Stewart family were very strong Quakers, and they were opposed to slavery. So in 1861, when the Civil War broke out, the Stewart family sold their farm in North Carolina, and they moved to Indiana. Now, growing up in Indiana, uh, Mr. Stewart had a number of problems with his health. He had bouts of rheumatic fever from time to time, and in some occasions, he almost came near dying. Uh, after having the last bout of rheumatic fever when he was in his mid-teens, he decided that maybe it had something to do with the climate of Indiana, and so he moved to Kansas to live with an older brother. So Kansas is where everything goes better, I guess. But uh, he uh, took a couple jobs in Kansas. First off, he uh, worked for a while with the railroad as an accountant. He had a clerking job in a haberdashery store. But he just seemed to have a natural sense of business. And so when he was in his early 20s, he and a friend decided to go on an adventure, and they heard about a little town in West Texas called El Paso, had a population of about 400 people at the time, but it was about to experience a, a boom because the railroad was going to come through town. And they thought they could set up a business in El Paso, they'd get in on the ground floor of that boom. So uh, it was quite an adventure just to get to El Paso. Uh, he nearly came close to uh, a run-in with the uh, Indians in uh, Geronimo at that time. Uh, he actually had a face-to-face -face meeting at one time also with uh, Billy the Kid. It was a very brief encounter, nothing dramatic happened, but just shows you the times that he lived. Uh, he and his friend, they set up a tent and they operated a grocery business out of the front of the tent during the day and then they would sleep in the back at night. And it wasn't uncommon uh, according to Mr. Stewart's memoirs, to hear gunfire at night and maybe even occasionally find a dead body on the streets in the morning. So what you hear or see in the uh, old movies about the West uh, in El Paso is, I guess, literally true. Uh, he lived in El Paso for about 14 years and eventually became one of the leading citizens of El Paso. And uh, they moved from the tent into more established buildings but while in El Paso, he was visiting with a friend and he heard about the friend's sister that lived in Vermont. He began a correspondence with her and eventually convinced her to move, uh, well, to marry him first and then move to El Paso. So this is Mary Horner Stewart. And here is uh, the final store that E.A. Stewart had in El Paso. This is going back to the uh, probably the early to mid 1880s or so. Well, maybe a little later, closer to 1890. Here you see an interior shot of the store. Uh, one of the products that Mr. Stewart became very impressed with was a new product that someone had just developed. It was called evaporated milk. And it's very hot in El Paso, and there was no refrigeration, especially in a store at that time. But this was milk that he could store on the shelf indefinitely without it spoiling. And uh, he set that in his mind that that's, you know, pretty interesting product. That might have a, a big future for it. Well, in El Paso, they had two children. 
This is uh, E.H. Stewart. This is Bridges' grandfather on the left, and uh, Catherine. E.H. Uh, e. Stewart had a reputation of not smiling a whole lot, and it looks like that might have been true even then. Oh, he looks adorable there. Uh, after the second child was born, uh, Mrs. Stewart became very ill, and the doctor told Mr. Stewart it was because of the elevation of El Paso, and he needed to move her somewhere nearer to sea level as soon as possible. And I think this might have been a fairly common occurrence in those days. You go to the doctor, they don't know what's wrong, say, well, it's the climate or the altitude, you better get out of here. And at least uh, it wasn't his worry anymore. So Mr. Stewart moved to another boom town. He went to Los Angeles in 1893. And he left his business in El Paso in charge of his partner. And he established a new partnership in Los Angeles. And this is a Craig Stewart and Company. Uh, after about a year or so in Los Angeles, Mr. Stewart found out that his partner in El Paso had proceeded to run his business into the ground and left Mr. Stewart responsible for all the debts. So that was one of his first bad experiences with partnerships. After about six years in Los Angeles, the partnership of Craig Stewart and Company also soured, and EA was forced to sell his business for pennies on the dollars that he had invested in it, and he also had to sign a five-year non-compete clause, which meant that he could not establish another business in the Los Angeles area. So now he's in his mid-40s, he has a family, he's looking for a new business opportunity. Los Angeles is kind of out of the question at this point. He's looking around, he has a friend by the name of Thomas Yerksa, the fellow on the right, and he had heard about a defunct uh, milk condensery in Washington State, in Kent, Washington, and the whole business could be purchased for back taxes. Uh, well, Mr. Stewart remembered in El Paso how uh, clever he thought the idea of evaporated milk was, and he thought, well, maybe that would be a good business to get into, even though he really didn't know anything about how to do that. But uh, they were able to get the services of the fellow in the middle, uh, John Mayenberg. He invented the process for evaporating milk in Switzerland. Uh, he actually worked for a company that is Nestle today, kind of got them going in the business. He was a hard person to get along with, so he moved to the United States. He set up an evaporated milk business in Illinois called the Highland or Helvetia Milk Company, which eventually became the Pet Milk Company, which I believe is still in business today. And after disputes in Illinois, he moved on, and they were able to acquire his services to help them establish the Pacific Coast Condensed Milk Company, again in Kent, Washington. Uh, I probably can read, but the fellow on the left is E.A. Stewart in his 40s. Uh, after about a year or so in business with uh, Thomas Yerksa, and the, the agreement was that Yerksa would be an absent partner, a silent partner. Mr. Stewart would run the entire business, but they split the business 50-50. After, again, about a year or two, uh, E.A. Stewart found out that Thomas Yerksa was looking to sell his share of the company to a competitor of Mr. Stewart's. And at that point, he pretty much had it with partnerships. So he proceeded to buy out Yerksa. He owned 100% of the company at that point. And also, this Mayenberg tended to be kind of a cantankerous, ornery old character, and he was concerned that if Mayenberg left, uh, EA really didn't have an idea of how to evaporate milk himself. Evaporation is the process of condensing the milk down by removing two-thirds of the water from the milk, sealing it up in a can, and pasteurizing it right in the can so it essentially is wholesome and will last uh, almost indefinitely on the, on the shelf. It's different than sweetened condensed milk, which had been around for a number of years before that. Sweetened condensed, again, is condensed milk, or it's evaporated to a point, and then sugar is added to replace the water as a preservative. Evaporated milk is pure whole milk with no additives. It's just about a third of what the uh, total volume of the milk was before it was condensed. <clears throat> 
or evaporated. Mr. Stewart didn't like the word condensed. He would say evaporated. But at any rate, uh, after a few years, he became concerned that Mayenberg would abandon him or do something crazy. And so E.A. paid him $25,000 to teach uh, E.A. Stewart's nephew how to uh, operate an, evaporate, uh, an evaporation unit and then sent Mayenberg on his way. And at this point, this is early in the 1900s, uh, E.A. Stewart is over $100,000 in debt and he's trying to get this little startup company going. $100,000 at that time was a lot of money. But Seattle was a boom town, much like the other towns he had tried to start businesses in. Uh, gold had been discovered in Alaska just a few years before, and thousands and thousands of people were coming to Seattle to buy supplies and then take the boats up to the uh, gold fields up in Alaska. And so there was a big demand for his evaporated milk because at that time that was the only way to get any kind of a dairy product into Alaska. There we've kind of gotten ahead of myself a little bit. I'm going to show you. This is a picture of the first condensary. This is taken in September of 1899. Uh, E.A. Stewart is the fellow on the horse there towards the bottom uh, right of the picture. The uh, building was a, a defunct hotel that was built by Ezra Meeker. Uh, anybody that knows Washington history may have heard of Ezra Meeker. He was a pretty well-known pioneer in the area at that time. Uh, again, the name of the company was the Pacific Coast Condensed Milk Company. Now, Mr. Stewart needed a brand name, a label, to put on his cans of milk, and he remembered when his grocery days at a red and white label like the Campbell's soup can was very much uh, attractive on the store shelf. It really stuck out. So Mr. Stewart thought he would like to design a label kind of on that order, but with a picture of a flower on it. He wanted people to think of sweetness and purity of the milk inside the can. So he applied, I think, for the name Rose, Rose Milk, uh, Lily, Poppy, a lot of different flower names, and come to find out all of those names had been trademarked by other dairy companies. So uh, one day he's walking down uh, Pioneer Square in Seattle, down on First Avenue between Columbia and Marion, and uh, he looks in the store window and he sees a display of uh, carnation cigars. Let me give you a little better picture here. And he thought, well, that's kind of a crazy name for a cigar but it would be a good name for a milk. And so he applied for the name Carnation. Uh, he was able to acquire that trademark. And from then on, uh, he designed the first Carnation milk label. Now that's, a, that's an 1899 label. If you read the upper right hand corner, it says, owing Owing to the excess of butterfat in the cream, some accumulation of solids will be found, which is pure butterfat and perfect, perfectly wholesome. Uh, he was trying to make a negative sound positive at that point. Uh, one of the problems was that the dairy industry, there really wasn't a dairy industry yet in western Washington. There was uh, some inferior cattle. Uh, the farmers really didn't know how to operate a modern dairy. And the cattle they had were mostly of the Jersey and Durham breeds, which tended to produce low quantities of milk, but a high quantity of butterfat. And when you condensed that milk, it increased the amount of butterfat uh, in the can. And especially if you shipped that milk to Alaska or something got shook around a little bit, it would form butter at the top of the can. Now the miners in Alaska thought that was great because that was just pure butter. But it wasn't very attractive to open up the can and have globs come out of the top at first. So uh, he started doing a little uh, exploring and he found out that the Holstein breed, which was more prevalent in the Midwest, produced a higher quantity of milk. They produced more milk of a lighter butterfat or a lower butterfat content. And that when you condensed or evaporated Holstein milk, it produced usually just about the right amount of butterfat to keep in the can and uh, keep attractive. And this is the days before homogenization, which homogenization is uh, 
uh, screening the milk through fine filters so that the butterfat breaks down and it mixes all through the milk. So Mr. Stewart's thinking about a way to get Holstein cattle to the northwest so that the farmers can uh, access those cattle and start improving their herds and producing the type of milk he's looking for. Uh, he's thinking that maybe a farm where he could bring in some of the best cattle in, in the world, start a breeding program, make those cattle available to the local farmers, uh, they would in turn improve their herds with those cattle and then they could sell that milk back to him to put into the cans of carnation milk. Uh, while he was thinking about that, one day he was describing the potential for dairy farming in the Northwest. It's uh, moderate climate, green grass the year round, plenty of rain and water. Uh, the cattle can, uh, they never have to suffer in the cold weather. Uh, there's always nice clear water running through the streams from the snow, snow melt from the mountains. And someone said to Mr. Stewart, uh, oh, those cows must be very contented. And from that, he came up with the slogan, milk from contented cows. It was one of the most well-known slogans in the United States for decades. Uh, probably don't hear it much anymore. In fact, a few years ago, the state of California used to advertise happy cows come from California. It was a direct ripoff of contented cows. And only contented cows come from this area. <laughs> but at any rate, he's thinking of a a dairy farm that can be a home for his contented cows. As the Carnation or the Pacific Coast Condensed Milk Company expanded, <clears throat> he put up condensaries in Oregon near Portland. He put a condensary in uh, Chehalis, one in Mount Vernon. And in 1908, he built his newest condensary in Monroe, Washington. And uh, if you see the smokestack there in the picture, that's still standing in Monroe today. So you get an idea. It's where the uh, condensary was is, I think, a grocery outlet store today. Um, E.A. Stewart was friends with Sam Hill. Uh, books could be written about Sam Hill. He probably have been. He was a, a kind of an eccentric guy, but he was a real go-getter. Uh, he was wealthy, he was the son-in-law of the founder of the Great Northern Railroad, and uh, he also was a Quaker, and he happened to have been born in the same neighborhood in North Carolina as E.A. Stewart at about the same time. Whether they knew each other in North Carolina, I don't know, but they, came, they became good friends here in Seattle. Uh, the Great Northern Railroad was promoting Monroe. It was a brand new town, and the, the railroad was really responsible for building Monroe. And it was going to be their first stop from the uh, railroad coming over Stevens Pass. And he may have very well encouraged Mr. Stewart to build his condensary there. When Mr. Stewart was in debt, uh, it was Sam Hill that loaned him money and was able to uh, encourage Mr. Stewart to keep going. Well, he probably also told EA that they were going to build a spur line up the Snoqualmie Valley, and that if he was interested in a farm, he might be able to get land in the Snoqualmie Valley at a relatively reasonable price before the railroad came through. Of course, that's all relative, too, because all land was pretty cheap then. But uh, he began uh, looking around first in Cherry Valley near Duval. Now, people who are familiar with this area might recognize this picture. This is about a mile north of the town of Duval. Uh, you're standing on what was the railroad at that time, but is now State Route 203. And this land is currently the Cherry Valley, the state uh, game reserve at Cherry Valley. Uh, so that's where the hunters go. Uh, Mr. Stewart wanted to buy the entirety of Cherry Valley. And that was close enough to the Monroe Condensary that he would have some place to ship milk. It was close enough to Seattle that he could visit it on a regular basis, and it just seemed kind of like the ideal place to be. There was four parcels of land that he was trying to get in a hold of, and he was only able to obtain three. One person's held out, and so Mr. Stewart 
ended up not being able to build his dream in Cherry Valley, which was probably lucky because if you look at the picture, most of it's underwater right there. Uh, very low ground tends to flood very easily. But they did put up some buildings and they used this ground as a secondary farm to the main farm here for a number of years. They held that property up until 1940 and they used to call it Little Carnation in the valley. In fact, tell people all the time that if he had been successful with this property, the town of uh, Carnation would still be called Tolt today. They would have never changed it, but Duval would probably be called Carnation today. So. Uh, that means something if you grew up in the valley because there was always a big rivalry between the towns of Duval and Carnation. So this was in 1908 and uh, he's still looking for property. He tells his vice president, Louis Hardenberg, to keep an eye out, see if there's any property he can have a uh, purchase in the valley. And when Mr. Stewart was away on a business trip back east, he got a telegram from Hardenberg that there was a farm for sale in the Snoqualmie Valley with some houses and, or the barns and some how, our house and the, uh, some cattle on the property and the entire property could be purchased for somewhere in the neighborhood of $25,000. Uh, Mr. Stewart simply sent a telegram back, said, buy it. Uh, you might be a little confused at this picture here. This is the property as it originally looked down on the valley floor. The big barn you see right in front of that is the uh, bank of uh, Horseshoe Lake down in the valley. And the barns are about where the machine shed is down there today. In fact, if you look out at Rosie's garden, you see some barns out there. So if you ever wonder why you're plowing up rocks out there, it's because they put rocks in there to build the barns in the first place. So. <laughs> Yeah, they, they put quite a bit of rock in there to put up the buildings. There was just muddy uh, floors in them originally, and they filled them up with rocks. Uh, it was <clears throat> about two years before Mr. Stewart actually came out to see the property. Uh, an interesting story about this is Hardenberg, the person who actually purchased the property for Mr. Stewart, uh, went on in the 1920s. He left the company and he went on to become the president of Nestle USA. So back in the days when this was Nestle property, I used to be able to tell the people out, you know, it was actually a Nestle guy that owned the land before Mr. Stewart. Strictly a technicality, he was doing everything under Mr. Stewart's uh, direction, but it's just kind of an interesting story. This is the house that was on the site at that time. This is about where the first house, when you go down the road uh, by Horseshoe Lake, this is the house that Mr. Stewart would stay in when he first came out. The, uh, the problem with the property, and you probably most of you are familiar with it, is that the valley does flood on a fairly regular basis, and that land would be isolated. Also, there were no roads out here at that time, so the only way to get to any of this property was by either crossing through somebody else's property or coming by river. Um, but Mr. Stewart, after he saw it in 1910, he thought, well, there really wasn't any potential for building his farm down in the middle of the valley floor. So he proceeded to buy a piece of property from his neighbor, uh, William Sykes, the farm next door to us. And that's the hillside you see here today. And that's what that looked like when he purchased it. This is the old Sykes house. And this is construction of the farm starting about 1912. Uh, some of the first buildings Mr. Stewart had to put in were these buildings up here. That's a bunkhouse and the uh, mess hall. Uh, like I say, there were no roads out here. In 1912, there wasn't much in the way of transportation. People couldn't come to work and then go home in the evening. So when you worked at Carnation Farm, you lived here and they pretty much had to be self-sufficient. They grew their own food. Uh, they had cooks, gardeners, uh, butchers, everything at that time. So you can see some of the first barns going up. The next thing he had to do was clear the land. Uh, the land had been logged off in the 1880s, but had a lot of stumps and brush had grown up or were left in the fields at that time, and they were really quite a mess. Also, the ground tended to be kind of swampy. So they had to uh, 
build these huge piles of stumps to get the wood out of the uh, wet ground so it would dry. And after being in these piles for about three years, it were dry enough that they could finally set those on fire. This was done using horses and mules. And Mr. Stewart finally bought a steam engine or a steam donkey, which was on skids. And it had pulleys and cables, and they could drag logs across the field, and they could put them into these big piles. It took them seven years to clear the valley floor at that method. And here you can see some of the first fires starting to take place. Uh, that's the, the roof line of the old house. You can see there's still no county road here at that time. And the uh, trench work you see down here is the ditch that runs along the road today. And that was some of the first drainage that went on here at uh, Carnation Farm. Now, building on a hillside was a challenge. They had to put in roads. They had to grade the land to make it level for put in the buildings. And as probably some of you know, the hard pan tends to be very close to the surface here on the hillside. And using horses and a few plows and things, it just wouldn't go into the ground at all. And so uh, they had to use a lot of dynamite back in those days. And if you're kind of lost where we're at, this is the uh, corner of the building down there on the lower right is the uh, corner of this building right here. And the building in the background is the original cookhouse or mess hall where the men got their meals. And then we turn, we look the other direction, that way towards the main barns. You can see originally all the barns were painted red. And they weren't painted white until 1924. So whenever you see chipping on the buildings, if you see red paint underneath, you know it's a vintage 1912, 1914 building. Uh, the old barn originally had a gambrel roof, or the, the pitched roof that you see on the other barns. Uh, one advantage, this, the big barn here, they had to excavate down 24 feet into the hillside to put in that building. Uh, but what Mr. Stewart envisioned was taking advantage of the slope and building these rampways right into the lofts of the barn. If you look at most barns built on the flat, you'll see a peak that comes out from the roof of the barn and there would be a track up there, and they had pulleys, and they would lower forks down, they'd grab hold of a load of hay, and then a horse would start walking, pull a cable up through, and then into the loft. And uh, it was a lot more difficult to fill a barn at that time. So Mr. Stewart built it so he could drive a, a team of horses right into the loft of the barn, drop the hay down to the level below, and then from there they could drop the hay down to the cattle, which were milked in the uh, the paddock barns. This is one of the paddocks right here where the cows were located. And then under that, there was always trap doors in those barns, and under that was where all the manure from the cows went. You'd shovel it down in holes, and they had ore or rail carts uh, in the basement. And you'll still see the rails in the floor today, and they could then wheel all of the manure out. So when you started at Carnation Farm, even when I was a kid working here, you literally started at the bottom and you had to work your way up. Uh, used to call them manure haulers, or they had another slang for it. <laughs> Ken and I are still there. <laughs> Some of us never got out of the basement. At yeah. uh, any rate, he had to build a rampway on one side. Well, you can't very easily back up a team of horses with a wagon. So they uh, put a ramp also out at the other end of the barn. So you could drive right on through. This is gathering up hay in the old days. You could tell there was a lot of manual labor done at Carnation Farm. This is a vintage 1914 pitcher. And you see the farm is really starting to shake shape. The, uh, I can go over what some of these buildings were built for. The uh, office buildings here were originally built as a horse barn for the, uh, the horses and mules that worked the fields. Uh, the uh, building up here is the bunkhouse. They would later add a third floor to that. And uh, the building we're in currently was a calf barn for feeding the young stock that was born on the property. And then the uh, two paddocks here were for the milking cows. That's where they actually got the milk. The uh, little building down here 
was the original powerhouse where the boilers were before Kurt's shop was put up probably around 1918, 1919 or so. And this is a picture from 1921. You can see the massive amount of construction that had gone on in a fairly short period of time. The uh, buildings off to the far left were the uh, test barns where the high producing cows would be kept and monitored and everything was recorded how much milk they were producing on a daily basis. And will give you a quick view of the uh, bunkhouse and the mess hall. The, uh, well, you can kind of see right out the back windows there is where the bunkhouse used to be. Or not the bunkhouse, but the, uh, the mess hall. And then right up here on this little patch of grass, if you go up the steps and you look to the left, there was this massive building. And eventually that was a three-story building and that would house 80 employees. Uh, kind of hard to imagine how they managed to fit that in. Uh, I'll give you a little better perspective here. This is a few years later. So it's, it's quite an impressive building, and you, you wouldn't think you could put a shed in there today. It's uh, why Mr. Stewart decided to put a building in that odd spot in the first place goes to show that he had plans for this farm way back, that he knew he didn't want to waste the flat land up where the hippodrome and all the, the great lawn and everything is. He wanted to cram those buildings down here because he had future plans. 